Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Welcome to the DMZ, everyone. I want to uh, apologize for my performance last week, Bill. Uh, I, I let you down. I let our viewers <laughs> down. I let this whole damn team down. Uh, I did not bring my A game last week, which, now I want to admit, my B game is still better than most people's A game. Uh, but uh, we're back to doing morning shows, and, and my energy level's up. And, uh, I, 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 you know, we're, we're in your homes every week. We're like a part of your family. You know, you're going to see our emotional ups and downs. I think, I think, that's part, yeah. I think, I think that's the wild ride our audience expects to be on. They don't want they don't well, to be a two-dimensional uh, cutout. I didn't get beat up last in the comments. I was expecting some uh, letdown, you know, from, from me having a subpar performance. And, you know, the commenters, they, they hung with us. So good for them. <laughs> um, but, but I've done uh, espresso shots this morning. And so I think I'm ready to rock and roll. Now, I saw yesterday on your Twitter feed, you seem very interested in the scrap going on between <laughs> between Donald Trump and uh, BuzzFeed reporter McKay Coppins, who had just done a profile of Trump. You got he was invited on the Trump plane from his press team, and and apparently one of Trump's his his PR guy was was fired uh, for agreeing. To, to getting Trump to agree to this profile, thinking it was going to be a puff piece, and it wasn't. Um, and uh, just so folks know, what, what do, do you know about uh, the background of McKay Coppins? He hasn't really been a household name. Uh, I know I know he's one of the main reporters at BuzzFeed, but mo folks might not know who he is. Okay, so uh, McKay Coppins is is a pretty young guy. He was at the I think he interned I, I think he interned at the Daily Beast. He certainly worked at the Daily Beast. When Ben Smith took over and they launched BuzzFeed Politics, I think he was one of the first hires uh, there. And he's so he's a young, sharp reporter. He's also a Mormon, so he he wrote uh, a lot about uh, about that during uh, during the Romney campaign. Um, and that actually makes it interesting because uh, you know one of the allegations when uh, Trump decided to fire back at this piece uh, that that. McKay Coppins was ogling, I guess ogling is the way to pronounce the word, uh, women at Mar-a-Lago, which is Trump's uh, hotel and restaurant in Palm Beach. Um, and that really does not strike people. Uh, that that seem, uh, People are incredulous about that. I mean, uh, I think, look, I think there's ethical questions to ask about uh, the McKay Coppins piece, which is why did it take three or four weeks for him to publish it? Um did he uh, present the notion that this was an implied off the record uh, time that they were spending together? Did he burn a source? I mean, all of those things are valid questions to ask. But um, most people who know McKay Coppins are sort of laughing at the uh, the pushback that, that was published on Breitbart by Matt Boyle um, that, you know, allegations coming from Donald Trump, you know, retroactively that, that McKay Coppins uh, was behaving inappropriately uh, during their time together. This is just a fun, fun story, you know. Now, now like, what uh, was in the I, original I, Trump piece <laughs> that was so offensive to Trump? I mean, are there are there specific factual uh, inaccuracies that they are alleging, or is it just the entire tenor of the piece? So, first of all, if you haven't read the original BuzzFeed piece, you should do so. It's a really, really interesting and well written piece, you know. Uh, it, it's a, a, a pretty long profile. Essentially, so McKay Coppins was, uh, I think it was in New Hampshire at a speech with Donald Trump. Um, they were, you know, uh, McKay had asked if he could profile Trump and, and they said yes. Um, interestingly, the email that, McCop that, that Coppins sent uh, has leaked out to the Daily Caller's Betsy Rothstein, uh, where he was bragging about how um, BuzzFeed gets more, BuzzFeed politics alone gets twice the traffic as Politico. So, um, what happened though is it snowed that this was like during, this was at the same time, I don't know if you remember, around the time of the uh, Chris Christie scandal. Uh, there was a big snow on the East Coast here. And uh, rather than, I guess, going to New York City, Trump diverted his plane to <laughs> Palm Beach and put 
uh, Coppins up at Mar-a-Lago, his, his very nice hotel, resort, uh, restaurant in, in Palm Beach. And um, McKay was reporting all the stuff that was said, right? So, for example, on the drive, uh, when they left, you know, when they left the speaking venue, McKay Cop- uh, Coppins reports that, um, that one of Trump's, quote, yes men, and, and by the way, Coppins refers to them as yes men, um, which other, you know, one man's yes man is another man's aid or loyal aid, but, but he calls them yes men. So, so some of this is sort of through the prism of his injecting, you know, opinion into it, um, that one of the yes men, you know, Trump is sort of lamenting the fact that, that nobody asked him about running for governor of New York. And one of the yes men says, um, well, uh, that's because they think you're too big. Like, like running for governor of New York's beneath you. And Trump's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what it was. Uh, you know, this is according to Coppins r- reporting. Um, and then, uh, reportedly, uh, according to Coppins, um, so there, there's another instance when, um, you know, they're like, are you sure you want to go to Palm? One of the, one of the yes men's like, are you sure you want to go to Palm Beach? It's, it's your anniversary saying this to Trump. And Trump's like, they don't, you know, don't worry about it, you know. So um, there were a lot of things like that. Now, there are some factual questions. So, for example, Coppins reports that he was the only national reporter uh, who actually covered the speech, the initial speech. The Trump people have pushed back at that, alleging that, that it's not true, that there was like an L.A. Times reporter there, that there was AP there. Um, as far as I can tell... Coppins was right on that account that other people wrote about it, but they weren't actually at the speech. Um, but in any event, you know, this raises questions, I think, about the implicit off the record thing. I mean, Trump probably thought that he could charm kind of wine and dine this young, you know, sort of shyish reporter and get a puff piece out of it. And Coppins probably played along and, and acted uh, friendly and as if, as if everything was going to be great, honky dory, and then screws Trump um, with a great, interesting piece, uh, which kind of shows you need a killer instinct to, to make it in this business. <laughs> um, so I think it's interesting, but Trump is now fired back. He, he's, he's having other people uh, sort of try to seek revenge on Coppins and, and most recently this Breitbart piece. Now, I assume this is all uh, good traffic for BuzzFeed, uh, but I thought BuzzFeed had a had a no haters policy. Uh, they they kind of weren't into you know takedown pieces. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying if anyone, if anyone deserves to be taken down in this world, it's Donald Trump. So I'm not I'm not mortally offended by it. Right. But but does it does it somewhat wrinkle the BuzzFeed brand to be embroiled in this controversy? Well, the problem, of course, is, and Trump's people are pushing out the notion that you can't trust McKay Coppin. So if he wants to profile your candidate, uh, beware. So the notion is that, um, you know, that the, the danger is that if, that if you burn sources, um, if, if you are extended graciousness and, uh, that someone is nice to you and you repay them by, uh, portraying them in an unflattering light and reporting on things. This reminds me a little bit of the, um, the Stanley McChrystal takedown piece in Rolling Stone, where, um, you know, McChrystal and some officers were sitting around drinking, you know, bullshitting and, and, and criticizing the president. And there's an implicit off the record. And if you're a reporter, you're embedded, embedded with them. I mean, you know, you and I, Bill, talk, uh, you know, we don't always say, hey, this is off the record, you know. <laughs> Um, because it's sort of an implicit off the record. And, and, and I think that Trump probably oh, and, felt... And the things that we say, if only people right. knew. Yeah, it's, it's scandalous. Um, so it reminds me a little bit of the Hastings story. Uh, obviously, the stakes are much, much lower here uh, than, than with taking down General McChrystal. Um, also, a little bit, reminds me a little bit maybe of uh, of what happened in Game Change, where, where Harry Reid thought he was... Uh, not on the record. So, um, you know, politicians ought to always assume that reporters will 
report what they say and that they're not your friends and that it's always on the record. I mean, that that's one lesson. Um, I do think that Coppins is aided a little bit by the fact that people don't like Donald Trump. And so they're going to say, yeah, well, he did. You know, Trump had it coming. So in other words, it may not hurt BuzzFeed's access. It may not hurt Coppins ability to do these things because people may just say Donald Trump had it coming. He, he's a, you know, he's a bad guy. He, he was showing off. And um, so I think that, that that may be part of the calculus here. Now, the interesting thing is it took BuzzFeed like three or four weeks to get around to publishing the story. And they only did it as far as I can tell after they reimbursed Trump. So they have an ethics policy <laughs> about they have an ethics policy about reimbursing, you know, that they can't sort of take gifts. And so Coppins, when they were at Mar-a-Lago, Coppins says, you know, I can't I can't stay here for free. And and, and Trump's like, oh, OK, OK, I, I, then it's going to be one hundred thousand dollars for the plane down here, you know, um, <laughs> for the private plane trip. Well, so what happened, though, is I guess Trump just charged them for a first class ticket. So it was like 850 bucks. And it is interesting that BuzzFeed essentially got, you know, got the invoice and paid it before they wrote this story. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, you know, someone will let me know if I got my timeline wrong. But I'm just I'm wondering why it took so long to write this story. There's speculation that Ben Smith, not McKay Coppins, uh, you know, the the Trump people are pushing the notion that it was Ben Smith who turned this into a hit piece. Um, and that that's why it took so long that it wasn't Coppins who wrote it. Um, so I don't know if this means anything. It's just it's a fun, fun story. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of gossip and a lot of snark associated well, with it. I, but I, I mean, do I don't really understand what I mean, I I, uh, I remember the piece from from and I, I kind of skimmed it a bit. I know it sort of tries to sort of tease out what why does Trump keep pretending he's running for president or running for anything when he never does. He's doing it for 25 years. Um, uh, but I, I guess the, the the question in my mind is, does this I – mean, I don't think anyone's going to side with Trump over BuzzFeed over this because Trump's credibility is is, is shot. Um, I don't think anyone sort of – anything in that article that doesn't seem uh, implausible as far as what, 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 what Trump and others would, would say. Um, but Yeah, uh, let, let me just say that real quick, Bill. I, you know, I will just real quick say – Everything McKay Coppins wrote seems it, it, it rings true. I right. mean, it, it's plausible. And the stuff that Breitbart wrote about Coppins does not sound accurate. It does right. not ring true for what but that's uh, worth. But does this change the calculus, maybe not for whether it's for about McCoppins specifically or just reportage in general? Uh, you know, if you're a candidate for high office and you're, and you're, you know, hustling for press attention, uh, there's definitely a premium put on access to get placement, to get attention to what you're doing. Uh, but access comes with, with risk <laughs> as far as what you, cause you don't control what's going to be report at the end. Uh, and I, I, there is this kind of, you know, uh, push pull. Uh, and obviously, you know, some candidates go uh, John McCain straight talk express and just let him on the bus and, you know, let it all fly. And some folks are very uh, tight lipped. And, you know, I, you know, the, the Bush team in 2004 was was was, you know, kind of a lockdown environment. So we'll say the Obama uh, campaign team was pretty tight on press access in in 2012. And uh, that, that, that worked for them. But of course, these are folks who. We're going to get coverage anyway. They weren't, you know, second tier candidates scrapping for every bit of media they could get their hands on. Um, uh, but if you're going to do the access route, it, it, I mean, logic would say, you know, you know, you know, dress up, you know, act, behave nicely. Don't do dumb things with the reporter in the room. You should do dumb things with reporters not in the room because you never know what someone's going to say. You would think yeah, people yeah, would live this lesson by now. No, you got to understand though. There, there's, there's a um, a manipulation going on, right? So when I'm when I was with John McCain on the Straight Talk Express, and he called us all as he, as he would always call reporters and journalists, you know, idiots, or uh, it was sort of an endearing thing, a bunch of jerks, you know. Right. Um, Trump, when 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 you're with Trump and he's this larger than life billionaire, and he's like, oh, there's a lot of good looking women down here. Um, in a way, it, there's this sort of 
ironic thing that happens is because he is saying something that you know he shouldn't say and he knows he shouldn't say it, you're now and you're now sort of um, in on it with him, and you're you're sort of uh, implicated now. And I think that it's a form of manipulation that you're he's treating you like one of the guys. He's treating you as if he can trust you. Therefore, you feel like you have to be his guy. You want to impress the Donald. You want to uh, uh, you want to be his friend, and you want to have more interviews with him. And uh, you you want. Uh, I think it's very. It can be very seductive. Now, obviously, uh, Buzz, you know, McKay Coppins was not seduced by that, um, but he probably acted as if he was, and he and he probably. I mean, you know, that's the question. Is like, do you think that Coppins actually ever like said, "Hey, this is going to be a really bad piece. You're not going to like it." He sort of had to probably play along with it, and that takes a certain type of person with a certain type of. Um, stomach who who can do that and and a certain killer instinct as a journalist that um i think he has now displayed that he has the ability to do it there's a there's a great there's a great quote from um this famous california politician named uh big daddy jess unruh who said uh as a politician he said uh if you can't i'm gonna clean it up here but he said if you can't take their money sleep with their women drink their booze and then still vote against them the next day then you're in the wrong business. <laughs> and, it, and his point was, like, you can hang out with lobbyists and, you know, take everything from them uh, and then still vote against them. And I think maybe this is the journalistic, uh, <laughs> the journalistic version. I'm not I'm not saying that Coppins did anything uh, partook in, in any of the drinking or the women, because I don't think he did, uh, despite the allegations uh, or the implications coming uh, from Trump now retroactively. Um, but I do think that that there is a certain thing where um, a lot of people would have been seduced by Trump and they would have been, wow, he knows who I am. He's saying he's flattering me. He's saying all these great things about me. He's putting me up at this awesome hotel. There's no way I can go write a negative piece, you know, betraying all the things that, that, that Donald said to me. Um, Coppins did that. And uh, that... I don't know if that makes him a horrible person or one hell of a good reporter, but he did now, it. To, to the to the point about the the allegations against Coppins that the Trump people, you know, uh, fed to Breitbart. Uh, what does this mean about Breitbart? Uh, is, is 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 this is this good for Breitbart to be the recipient of uh, you know Trump fed smears? To, I, mean, I mean, obviously, its, it's audience is not you know a politically heterodox audience; it's a conservative audience, and Trump is. Basically, a, a you know a, a conservative uh, figure. Uh, uh, d- do you think that conservatives are going to uh, respect Breitbart for take for effectively taking Trump's side here, um, or does this besmirch what they're trying to do since they're seen as you know being Trump's handmaiden? I think it hurts them honestly. Um, you know, there are a couple of my former colleagues are over there. Um, and one of them is a guy named John Strong, Jonathan Strong, who is a fabulous journalist. I worked with him at the Daily Caller. He is a great reporter. Um, he I, mean, I, at, I just he, want to add that he was doing stuff for the National Review side by side with Robert Costa during a lot right. of debt limit stuff. I mean, and, and, and before he, that, and before that, he was at before that he was at Roll Call. I mean, so and he, he, is he, a, he functioned as a straight reporter. I mean, he was not functioning. He's a great as an ideologue in that role. And I was actually surprised they went to Breitbart because they've been, you know, not so journalistically uh, stringent over their years. But I took well, it as... John, I mean, John is a great reporter who could be at the New York Times or the Washington Post or Politico. I mean, he is... I would, if I were, I would hire him in a heartbeat. Uh, so when they hired him, I thought maybe they were going to rebrand and, and, and sort of try to fill the gap, uh, you know, since he and Costa had both left National Review. Um, and I think this sort of thing sets that, if, if that effort, if there was an effort to uh, to do that, I think this sets that effort back. Uh, well, the shift gears uh, to self-promotion. Uh, I had a piece up at the, at the week, uh, this week, uh, talking about um, uh, what, what struck me. I, I, there was a Marist poll that came out last week that Hillary, you know, you know, lapping the field, 
uh, beating every Republican. The closest was Paul Ryan at eight points. Most of the other field was, was, was double digits. And she was beating Chris Christie by 21 points. And what particularly struck me was that in the previous Marist poll in January, it had people mostly mostly believing Chris Christie, saying Chris Christie is mostly truthful in his response to the Bridgegate scandal. And now that those numbers flipped, and now they see, seem as mostly untruthful. Uh, and what I took from that was, so here you have this, this you know four-week period or so since mid-January where – MSNBC has been giving Christie the treatment, uh, prioritizing the scandal, you know, uh, magnifying every possible angle, uh, you know, uh, uh, interviewing all sorts of uh, New Jersey legislative investigators and whatnot. Um, at the same time, Fox has been t uh, taking it to Hillary on Benghazi. I mean, they've not dropped the Benghazi beat at all. Uh, they've been launching new allegations. Uh, there was a new Republican, House Republican report on Benghazi they gave a lot of play to. Um, when the New York Times, at the end of December, wrote a piece that, uh, that, that, that debunked a lot of conservative myths about Benghazi, Fox went nuts and attacked the New York Times, said they're doing it, they're being, you know, Hillary's PR arm. Uh, but all that Fox News fury hasn't dented Hillary at all. Whereas, and, Despite the fact that Fox has a bigger audience and has been in this, you know, sort of, you know, muckraking game for a lot longer, uh, MSNBC is kind of the new kid on the block. They haven't really done a lot of scandal coverage. That hasn't really been their thing. This is kind of a new phase of their lean forward strategy, and and they're drawing blood. Uh, and so, why? So my piece of the week was, you know, why is MSNBC's scandal coverage better than Fox's? Why? Why are they more influential than Fox's? This is really not talking about, you know, uh, uh, the specifics of the reporting, but just in, in terms of basic influence, they, MSNBC is influencing Christie more than Fox is influencing Hillary or people's perceptions of, of the two, despite the discrepancy in audience size. And I just think this is evidence that Fox, their credibility has been so shot because they've they've chased down so many rabbit holes. They they don't budge when uh, exculpatory evidence comes to light. They stick with their pre-cooked narrative over and over again. And so even if their audience is bigger, it's it's contained. It's a, it's, it's a true echo chamber that doesn't get out beyond that. And it used to. And I feel like they, they used to be able to catapult stuff into the mainstream media a lot more. And now they're not able to do that as easily. And MSNBC has, but even though there's some people that's kind of scoff at MSNBC, you know, Bill Maher just came out and said, uh, we're, uh, it's over between us, you're turning into Fox, because you're so, you're so, you're so obsessed with, 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 with Bridgegate. Um, uh, I, I know anecdotally, I know some people are like, yo, I've had enough, I've heard it, you know, I, I think cause some people feel like you, you've already, you've already killed this guy. <laughs> what else is there left to say? Well, I, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the Bill Maher category. Um, I think but, both, but nevertheless, know, they, they still are. Um, they, 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 they say what they have done has driven the story in a way that Fox was not able to drive the Benghazi story. Though I think you're confusing, you know, correlation with causation. I mean, there was the one week, obviously, when the uh, the mayor came out on up with uh, Kornacki and uh, drove did drive the narrative there. But aside from that, I just think they're beating a dead horse. I mean, the fact that Christie is being hurt, I, I don't know that you can attribute that to MSNBC, aside from that one obvious instance. Well, I, let's let's think of a world where MSNBC did not exist. Um, I mean, it's pure hypothetical. Obviously, you, you could spit out different scenarios with that hypothesis. But when Christie gave his initial press conference, there was a lot of punditry that... Wow, that was a good press conference. He he stuck it out. He answered every question. He really he he, he took care of business. He he fired the people that needed to be fired. Um, you know, there's no way he'd be so crazy to do that himself. So the early poll numbers suggested that was true. You know, the January poll numbers he, he was holding steady, and so a lot of press was acting like, well, I guess this is pretty much over. And MSNBC was kind of alone, sort of nationally. I, 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 obviously, there's the Jersey reporters, too, so you, you got to factor that in. But the MSNBC people were like, no, this is not over. There's plenty of unanswered questions here. We're going to keep at this. 
And, and I think as part of that, you know, Kornacki gets the scoop. Kornacki gets the Hurricane Sandy scoop from the Hoboken mayor that gives a story a second wind, uh, and really expands, you know, uh, the, 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 the scope of questions. Well, what was really underlying, if, if there's a sort of larger, uh, corrupt culture, what was the real reason why the bridge closures happened in the first place? Is it about these issues about, uh, uh, controversial developments, which they've been, they've been speculating about over the past, past few weeks? Uh, I, I think it's possible that this could have just died down. Um, I mean, the, the Jersey investigators at, 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 the, at the legislative level might have kept doing their work, but there wouldn't be this this drip, drip, drip. But the Hoboken that, Mayor that story weighs Christie down. But two things. I mean, one, the Hoboken Mayor story is like a month old now, and yet Chris Matthews will, apropos of nothing, be talking about the Bridgegate scandal. Then you know. The Bridge Ghazi scandal, or whatever you want to call it, tonight. <laughs> and number two, I think it's been pretty well illustrated that uh, she didn't get less than her fair share for Hoboken uh, from the the Hurricane Sandy funds. I mean, there've been a lot of pretty reputable people uh, and outlets who have poked holes in that story. So it may be bogus to begin with, and even if it was. This is a long time, uh, we're a long ways removed. My problem with what Fox and MSNBC are both doing is that it doesn't reflect any reality in terms of what's driving a news cycle. I mean, by all accounts, everybody today should be talking, I would think, about U- the Ukraine, uh, about Venezuela, um, about McKay Coppins and Trump, um, about the CBO report and minimum wage. I mean, these are relevant stories. Everybody I follow on Twitter, people who are, you know, political reporters and analysts and commentators, these are the stories that everybody else in the real world are focused on today. So it seems to be a non sequitur when I turn on Chris Matthews tonight, and he's harping on a scandal, a months old scandal in New Jersey. And I can say the same thing about when I turned on Fox News last night, and they were talking about Kathleen Sebelius and Obamacare. I mean, I'm not, not to say that these aren't rel- important issues, but they have, they in no way reflect the real world of what people are talking about today. And it's, it's as if they've become totally disconnected from covering the news or the news cycle and are much more interested in driving their own agenda. Um, which is fine. Sometimes you can force stories into the mainstream, uh, by focusing on them. But I mean, I, I don't know how they can do like, how can Chris Matthews do yet another story on the Chris? I don't. I don't know how they have like the patience and and the. Uh, I, I would have if I were you know if I were a host of a show, I would have a very difficult time justifying doing an, yet another segment on Bridgegate today unless there's new information. And yet they will do it every day in and day out. I guess until uh, they they decide not to. Well, I, I haven't watched MSNBC in the past 24 hours. I don't know what percentage they gave to uh, Ukraine or to the CBO report. I, I would imagine some, but I don't. I don't. I don't have numbers for you. Uh, I don't think they've gone literally wall to wall on Christie. But to your main point, I mean, they obviously have prioritized the story in a way that no other national news outlet has. Uh, the same way Fox has prioritized other stories that they think their audience, you know, want, wants to see. I, I think that, um, uh, I, I do think that it, it, I think it's new for MSNBC to do it in this way. Uh, I don't think they are the first to do this. I mean, look, Lou Dobbs used to do immigration, immigration, immigration every single day. And that was ridiculous uh, and, then. That was horrible uh, then, and it's horrible now. And look, when, but, when, but, when the but, Christie scandal my, my, broke, they did great reporting on it. Don't get me wrong, I think that it deserved to be covered and, to, and obsessed on, but this is ridiculous. Well, my question here, I mean, I mean, we can talk about, you know, what's sort of good for media or bad for media as far as, you know, quality is concerned. You know, my focus on this one piece was not talking about that. We're talking about who is, who is doing it better, <laughs> who's having the better, uh, the better time, the more influence in pursuing this strategy. Uh, I, I think both networks are going to do, what they think is good for their bottom line. They're, they're primarily businesses. They are trying to appeal to their audiences. I'm sure if they get to a point where MSNBC feels like they are losing audience because people are turning off Christie coverage, they're going to scale back their Christie coverage. I don't think they are, 
I, I don't think they are they are partisans in that respect. And I, and I was talking about it in my piece, you know, they went hard on Anthony Weiner in 2011 and 2013, um, you know, because they thought it was a good story. Well, let me ask you, uh, let me ask you, Bill, because I disagree with you. I think it's in both cases they're probably um, undermining their brands and 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 not not advancing the story. And I think you're I think you're confusing correlation with causation. But what? Assuming you, let's just assume you're right. What is MSNBC doing better? Like, what are they doing differently that is leading them to a better result? Well, I, I, what I think they're doing better is uh, one: they they don't chase down every rabbit hole. You know, they they they're not in the scandal business no matter what. I mean, I think I think Fox it has, and this is true for a lot of conservative media. You know. It's Salinger and it's Fast and Furious and it's IRS. Uh, you know, it's one after another. And even when these stories don't pan out, they still stick to it as if they are panning out. You know, I think that that undermines credibility. I think MSNBC doesn't do that. Um, and I think MSNBC is willing when there is a Democratic scandal they think uh, is legit, they do take that on also. They don't, they're, they're not partisan about who they go after. Uh, but at the same time, they obviously have a liberal audience and a liberal audience that has more interest in the Christie scandal than a Fox audience does. And they're trying to give their audience what, uh, what they want. But I think they do it in a way that is not, I, I think they separate the fact from the speculation. They speculate, they punditize, dude, no doubt. You know, they, they throw ideas out there that aren't necessarily backed up yet, but I think they're clear when they're doing that. They don't pretend that they know more than they do. Uh, and they do actual reporting. They, they get some actual scoops. You know, they, so they, they directly drive the coverage also. They're not just sitting back and, 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 and just blathering. So I think all those yeah. things combined um, are, are, are making their, their coverage more influential uh, than Fox's coverage has been. Well, it is funny. I mean, you know, if you landed here from another planet and just turned on MSNBC, you would think that the New Jer what's happening in New Jersey is the most important story and what everyone's talking about. And nobody's talking about it right now. You and I know that. And I say the same thing about Fox. Um, and so, you know, it, it is it is weird uh, that you know, that they've essentially staked out these, these stories. Um, I get, I mean, I guess, you know, you, you're, you're arguing that this is like a free market and, and that, that this is a smart business decision. Um, I suppose you're right, but, uh, well, we, I mean, have we got, I mean, I feel like the era of news editors, I mean, this is what newspapers do. They sit back and say, okay, we are, we are going to tell the, the consumer what is the news and what isn't the news? We're deciding what's news. We're telling you what's more important. And you are trusting us to make those judgments for you. And I, I, I fully, I like that model, you know, on a meritorious basis. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to be, but just I'm not trying to be I mean, anti-elitist here. A month but old... I feel like that, that model is, has not been terribly profitable. And the, and the outlets that have saying, look, we're going to give the people what they want and, and find the niches that want certain things. Those folks are doing better. Yeah. Um, so a month's old scandal with no new developments, I suppose, Trump's revolution. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not saying one is more important than the other, but I, I, I think the, cre the creative part of it is finding a way uh, to find the new developments and, and to advance the story. Even when the other reporters aren't aren't finding that, I mean, I I think if you're just doing the same punditry over and over again, you know, even your most hardcore fans are going to tune out. Uh, I I think MSNBC has found this. Is, I mean, this is Lou Dobbs' challenge. How you talk about immigration every single day, all the time? He found a way. I mean, I I don't necessarily have the, the stamina to, to pound on one subject over and over again, but he did, and he and he and he had good ratings, you know, from a, a slice of the public. Yeah. And I found what he was doing to be abhorrent and and uh, and factually flawed in many many instances. But as a business model, it worked for him for a long time. Hey, Bill, uh, have you been watching House of Cards? I've not been watching House of Cards. I don't watch a lot of political fiction. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have enough political nonfiction in my day. <laughs> Um, but I feel, but, like, but is there something you can say about it? it doesn't have spoilers? 
Um, so, well, I, I'll just say this to make it relevant to our discussion. Uh, Frank Underwood watches Morning Joe at night. He tapes it. Um, <laughs> and Ashley Banfield, I think that's her name from CNN, uh, is a good actress, but I think much a much tougher interviewer in the fictional world than than anybody would be in the real world. <laughs> but you should watch it, Bill. I um, it's addictive, man. You start. Wa- I'm telling you what you you get into. It. It's one of those things that if you you get into it and and you're there, you're not you're not turning it off. It, it'll it'll totally now, what, what was, it'll what, suck you in. What was the other political show that had? Was it Alpha House? Was the other one that was an online political show? I don't know. I, like I didn't. I, I never even watched West Wing. Um, but you know, it, it, it's hit or miss. But if I get like for me, it's like if I get into something, then I'm into it. You know, um, right. like I didn't watch Friday Night Lights while it was on, but then I totally got hooked on it when it was on Netflix. I think Netflix is like the uh, is you know that that's that's what'll get me hooked if it's on there because then I have the Apple TV I can just project it up on my big TV and. Uh, all that. You want to talk uh, <laughs> minimum wage, or you want to bail? How we how we do? It? We 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 do minimum wage. I, I know it's a, it's a subject of interest to you, interest to me. Uh, it it it's a real story, right? It's not one of these trumped up stories from the, from the cable networks. Um, they should devote more so time you have, to this. Yeah. Well, now, I actually had written previously that I thought uh, minimum wage would pass the Republican House because historically. Uh, every president since it, it was installed in, in 38 has raised the minimum wage, Republican or Democrat, with the exception of Reagan. She's the only exception. Uh, and this has been true even when there are Republican Congresses and Democratic presidents who don't like each other. Uh, you know, Truman got very little through Congress in his day. Uh, it was a democratically controlled Congress, but conservatives had the majority uh, and stymied him on most things, but not minimum wage. Uh, Clinton in uh, 96, um, you know, that the, the G- Gingrich was not the friendliest of, of uh, speakers to, to Clinton, uh, but he had a number of vulnerable Republicans who were begging Gingrich to let a vote occur, and, and Gingrich relented, and uh, Bob Dole uh, was, was, was fighting Clinton, but then he stepped down uh, to focus on this presidential run, and Trent Lott uh, let a minimum wage vote go through, and it passed. Uh, so I felt the history would, would, would repeat. It's, it's, it's always a very popular issue. It doesn't cost the, the treasury money. Uh, and Republicans will usually stand down so long as it's paired with some other kind of, you know, goodies for small business so they can say it was a balanced, balanced bill. Uh, negative the CBO report, which, uh, uh, makes a projection. I, I, I fear there are a couple of, uh, if, if I if I may uh, 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 slant the introduction of this whole topic, uh, uh, you know, the headline is CBO says minimum wage will lose jobs or minimum wage will lose five hundred thousand jobs, and that's not quite what it's saying. Uh, it's saying one, it, it gave two different sets of projections for the ten dollars and ten cents proposal and a different set for the nine dollar proposal. Uh, and two, it's talking about a range of possibilities based on, you know, all sorts of different studies on the, on the subject. Uh, and it's not saying that 500,000 people are going to get fired. It's saying there'll be 500,000 jobs fewer than there might otherwise been for a variety of reasons. Um, in most cases, not because someone got fired, but because someone, someone leaves a job and they don't get replaced or something like that. Um, so, uh, so I guess my question is, is the headline so damaging that any explanation can't save it at this point? Republicans have their excuse to not act on it. Uh, or is it still, it's a popular subject in general that, you know, most people don't read CBO reports and you can look at the, uh, uh, the $9 an hour numbers which are far more tame uh there's a range from you know a slight job loss to a, to a slight job increase you know it's effectively saying not much impact on the job market at all it still would be a pretty decent jump from 725 to go to nine 
and you can still pair it with other kinds of goodies for for small business. So is there still a room for compromise here, uh, or is just the impact of the headline too much uh, for Democrats to overcome and it gives an easy out for Republicans to, to bag the whole thing? So, I, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, in the future, as it has been in the past, raising the, the minimum wage will remain popular because it just sounds like a compassionate thing to do, even if it costs jobs. It sounds good. I do think this kills it in the short term. Um, but I have a couple points that I want to make about it. Um, number one, I want to make the point that um, when conservatives oppose things like raising the minimum wage, it is not because they are horrible, mean people. It is because they believe, you know, and economists are divided on this, uh, but we believe that raising the minimum wage will mean that fewer people get hired. You're raising the cost of hiring somebody, which will drive, you know, which means fewer people will be hired. So, in other words, if if the Democrats have their way, there will be more people who are doing better and more people who have nothing. So, we would argue that this will actually increase the unemployment rate, and it will actually sort of grow income inequality in a sense. It, it's instead of spreading the wealth around, you either have no job, pretty good job. Uh, whereas maybe you would argue it's better to have two people making seven dollars an hour than one person making fourteen an hour and one person making zero an hour. Agree with that or not? I just want to make the point that I think well, I mean, conservatives I mean, are, are oftentimes criticized. If you come out against the minimum wage hike, you're you're considered evil, mean. Um, this is a philosophical difference, and I think that it's important to note. In this case, the CBO actually uh, confirms the position, but whether you agree with the CBO report or not, I do want to stress the point that I think, you know, when conservatives, uh, that, that they have obviously the best of intentions here. And I think a lot of times their motives are, are impugned. Now, if, if you are, if you are a conservative with, with, with good intentions on this subject, um, you, you simply want there to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, people with, with good jobs and good wages and putting roofs over their heads for people who work hard and play by the rules, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I mean, the, the, you have folks to the left saying that CBO was, was basing stuff on, uh, conservative, uh, assumptions. As you said, there still is a wide range of debate amongst economists. It's not, it's not settled one way or the other what the impact on jobs is for minimum wage increases. And it depends, of course, what, how much of an increase we're even talking about. Um, so we shouldn't treat the CBO report as being, I mean, they're not even saying this is precisely true. And this is sure to happen. And there's no other scenario plausible. Um, there's still a range of possibilities. You can't, and, and a range of other factors that are involved that can't be captured in one, in one study. Uh, could it, and, and even in this report, it's saying, look, you're still going to have a rise in income. You're still going to have millions and millions of people with higher incomes because of this, and not just at the minimum wage level, but in some of the notches above that. Um, you could still make the argument that it is a net positive, even if there are some, even there are some losers in the process. Uh, couldn't you come if if you're coming at this with good intentions and good faith? Say, okay, if you just did minimum wage, you got a bunch of winners and some losers. Can we pair this with something else? To make sure we don't have those losers. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, right. a standalone bill. I mean, they've, they've paired this in the past with small business tax cuts, for example. That might be harder today because of the budget caps that they're working under. Uh, but w couldn't yeah. we think of something? Uh, or, or try to find something to say, okay, if you're going to do this to help you know, people in this camp, let's do something else to the people in the other camp. I mean, that, that shouldn't be that hard to solve, right? Well, I think, first of all, I mean, I, I guess a few things. Well, let, let, let me start. I do want to answer your question, but let me start with giving, I think, a fair take on the different points of view. So conservatives would argue that if you raise the price of a job, you will have fewer jobs. It is, it's supply and demand. And, the, and not only that, but you would really incentivize, auto, you know, sort of uh, automation. So, for example... You know, if I if I own, I'm a small business owner and I own a little uh, fast food restaurant and I have, you know, maybe two people working at, uh, at the lunch shift, um, maybe I, I just 
you know, put out a couple thousand dollars and get one of those self-serve, you know, Coke and Diet Coke refill machines um, and, and only have one guy working now, right? Because the cost of that machine, I have to, you know, dole out a few thousand bucks to, to put it, but I don't, you know, no one's going to tell me I have to raise the minimum wage for that machine once I make the investment. So, I mean, conservatives would argue that that businesses are in the business to make money, and um, rather than hiring two people, there'll be a point of diminishing returns where they'll decide, let's do something else. We can only afford to have one guy. Let's automate, uh, you know, use technology or whatever. Now, the, the liberals are, you know, the Obama administration, Gene Sperling, whomever, they actually have a, a, a tougher sell in this case. Usually it's conservatives who are worrying about like unintended consequences and, and trying to explain dynamic scoring. In this case, I think the liberals actually, you know, once you get past the sort of knee jerk reaction that raising minimum wage is good, um, they actually have a tougher argument to make. They're really arguing that, that, that there should be dynamic scoring. And so they're going to basically say that like, okay, if you raise the minimum wage, um, there's a lot of magical things that are going to happen that, that the CBO may not be capturing, right? So they're going to say, okay, well, if, if you raise minimum wage, then workers are going to be more productive and they're going to have higher morale. So they're going to do a better job, which means the business is going to grow. You're going to have more customers because the people taking care of them, serving them are happier, that you're going to reduce employee turnover, uh, which will improve profits. I mean, so there are all these like, factors out there that you can't really quantify that are going to sort of magically happen. Um, so, I mean, I do think it's important to sort of note that both sides have uh, sort of assumptions about what is going to happen if you raise minimum wage. Um, having said that, uh, you know, I, I think, well, I do want to answer your question and, and I've, I've sort of jabbered on specifically, Bill, refresh my memory, what, uh, well, 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 couldn't you couldn't you oh, pair this with something? I mean, even if because uh, I mean, the CBO, if, we're, if we're taking the CBO report in full, it, it is saying that there, I think it's like sixteen million people would have higher income. It's not like nobody wins. Uh, so if you have sixty million people are going to be helped by it, but five hundred thousand people, uh, it's not even quite saying that. But let's just for for simple simplicity's sake, let's just say it. So you got sixty million people do better, five hundred thousand do worse. Can't we pair it with something? So those five hundred thousand people don't get uh, don't get the short stick. I mean, you, you, it doesn't have to be a standalone bill at the end of the day. If we're trying to help people, if we're trying to approach this in good faith, why can't we have a hybrid policy? So, here? I would I would say that in a time when unemployment and poverty are problems, it would be insane to do something to increase unemployment. Having said that, I think that rather than a hybrid approach, you can have alternative approaches. So, for example, Michael Strain who's an economist at AEI, was recently on my podcast, he actually advocates lowering minimum wage, but extending unemployment benefits, um, which is sort of a, an unorthodox viewpoint. He also advocates earned income, you know, uh, ex expanding earned income tax credits. Um, so I think in the sense that there, that conservatives, you know, can be compassionate during this downtime and have all alternative ways of helping people who are struggling in this economy. I absolutely think it's possible in terms of having a hybrid approach that pairs raising the minimum wage with some sort of other thing to offset that or to fix the problems that it would create. I think that would be counterproductive. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> it doesn't answer the question satisfactorily uh, to me, but um, uh, I, I just think that, uh, uh, but, but I take your point that there are there are conservatives who have uh, a belief system that's not predicated on just screwing people, that they actually have a different belief in what's going to make the economy grow and what's going to create good jobs and whatnot. Uh, I just think that obviously there's always going to be people with different belief systems on that score. And in the past, there's been uh, a meeting halfway. Okay, you, th you, you think minimum wage raises incomes. These folks think minimum wage hurts hurts small businesses. 
let's raise the minimum wage and give other help to small businesses and mitigate those effects. And I think that has generally worked well over time. That we haven't we we have raised the minimum wage before. We have a minimum wage. It's not like no one's proposing to abolish it right now, uh, or no one's proposing it seriously. Um, we have paired that and said, okay, you need to have a there is a floor. Uh, if if we had full employment at two dollars an hour, that would not be good. People would not be living well in that scenario. Uh, so we have a floor. We do other help for small business to make sure that it doesn't lead to uh, un unnecessary job loss. Uh, and I think we could, I think it's plausible one could do that again. Uh, I'd like to see Michael uh, Strain's uh, uh, views scored by the CBO and see how that would, how that would look. Uh, and so we'd have some apples apples comparisons here. Um, but even still, I just feel like there, there, sh there should be a way to, to take the best from column A and the best from column B. Um, yes. At, at the very least, Bill, the, the point I do want to make and just reiterate again is that a lot of times I think conservatives are accused of being, you know, mean spirited, cold hearted, not caring about the poor. Um, and the truth is that this is a prime example of how, um, there are two competing worldviews and visions for how best to uh, help people and grow the economy uh, and benefit the most Americans. And I think it's it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, one side and both sides do this on different issues. But uh, I, I just I think this is a prime example of how it's not about um, being mean or not caring. It's about a difference of opinion. In this case, backed up by the CBO, but I, I look, I would still have the same view. If the CBO had, had scored differently, it wouldn't have changed my mind. And I, and I assume it's not going to change yours, but I do think it's indicative of how, you know, both sides uh, can care and want to help people um, and have very different conclusions regarding how best to, uh, to do that. So um, I see this as a, a, I, uniting, I think Republicans have a, have a, a positive uniting story. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have a different problem with the unemployment insurance issue because they have been, or some have been saying, well, I would be for it. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to hurt uh, the unemployed. I, I do think they should deserve extended benefits, but I don't want it to cost us money. Let's find an offset for it. And Harry Reid had proposed at one point, okay, let's, let's tack a year on to sequestration. And people said, no, 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 that's bad. That's backdoor spending cuts down the road that won't stick. And that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. And all of a sudden, just this past week, Republicans embraced that exact offset to scrap these cuts in military pensions that were just agreed upon a month ago. Um, so it, it sort of exposes that, you know, it, it, if it really wasn't about the offset, it was about the issue. Um, and uh, you, you see, we've seen Politico today, you still see some Republicans, uh, Dan Coats, Rob Portman, Susan Collins, Mark Kirk. You know, they still kind of want to do a deal, it seems. They just want to be able to say we reformed the UI program in some way and Democrats don't like the reforms they're proposing so far as they think they would hurt the program. Uh, but uh, I, I think it did expose at minimum that it really wasn't about the offset for a lot of people because obviously they found the offset appropriate for a different... It may not be about the offset, but it could still be uh, a noble... I mean, conservatives could still have a very legitimate point of view where they believe that expanding unemployment uh, benefits will actually hurt people, will, will get them, uh, you know, es essentially uh, in a cycle of dependency, uh, will, will cause them to turn down other opportunities that may not be, that may not pay them as much as they are looking for. Um, so they may or may not be right about that, but to question their motives, uh, which is often done in politics. I, I think I think the motives would be I think the motives would be less in question if they were embracing some package of ideas yeah, as a party. Say here here is our plan to increase jobs and and uh, give relief to those looking for work. Um, right now, it's been generally a lot of talking points. I mean, you ha you 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 legitimately bring up the AEI report from Michael right. Strain. Um, which I, and I think there are, a lot, there are a number of folks who left and say, you know, we don't agree with all this, but there's some good ideas in here. This is not this is not an insincere uh, package, but you haven't seen the Republican Party 
pick that up and, and take parts of it and say, okay, this is our right. plan now. If, if there's only been obstruction and nothing proactive so far. All right. Got to go, Bill. Thanks. See ya. Okay. Bye. Next week. Bye-bye.